happy, happy Cynthia Ty is with us. She's incredible. We had a show. When did we have a show? Was it six or eight months ago, maybe yes. something like that? Yes. Uh, Cynthia is truly amazing. Cynthia was a prosecutor uh, in Kona, uh, and she decided one day she'd file an application with The Hague and be a prosecutor of international crimes in The Hague and an investigator there. <clears throat> and she trundled off to The Hague for seven or eight years, as I recall. Seven, yes. Seven years? Yes. And prosecuted war crimes and international crimes? Yes, genocide, I mean, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Yeah. And then she came back. <laughs> but when she came back, she established a little company. That's right. A little nonprofit. A you little nonprofit. So Project Expedite Justice. That's right. Operating out of Kona. You didn't know this. You know, this is why you should watch Think Tech. So you would know things <laughs> like this. So That's right. International criminal investigation company operating out of Kona as a nonprofit, helping the world deal with international crimes, crimes against humanity, international financial crimes. And she's still active. Gosh, you know, sometime if you need somebody to carry your bag, Cynthia, I'll be there. Take me with you, okay? <laughs> You can be my partner in crime. <laughs> all right, all right. In crime. So, you know, I wanted to talk about your most recent and most spectacular adventure uh, as an investigator of such crimes, having to do with, uh, with uh, Paribas. Um, uh, and Paribas is a huge, big French bank. What was it, three or four biggest bank in the world? Uh, BNP Paribas is the... And the largest bank in France, and right now, I believe, the fourth largest bank in the world. All right. And uh, it's about uh, financial crimes by this bank in Sudan and a couple of other countries. That's right. And why did you get involved in this? What happened? Somebody sent you a letter? What? Well, it's, a, it's actually quite a long story. We started following this case in 2014, 2015. Um, they were, the case originated actually right here in the United States in the Southern District of New York, which is our, the center of money, Wall Street. Um, Berman. Exactly. Where the money flows, as they say. And when, um, when there's an actor, it could be a government, an individual, a group that commits bad acts, human rights violations, and or corruption, the U.S., the Office of Foreign Asset Control here in the U.S., sanctions them and prohibits the use of U.S. dollars. This is an extremely effective tool because it can cut off money flows for obviously people who are committing, um, are corrupt or committing human rights violations. So in, the, um, in May of um, 2015, BMPP pled to the charge of trading with the enemy and a, another financial crime for providing funds in US dollars to the government of Sudan. At that time, the government of Sudan was a, was a sanctioned entity. So they were not supposed to trade using U.S. dollars. Who determines that? Um, Department, of, Department of Justice. American U.S. Department of Justice. That's right. So um, in the Second Circuit, they brought a case. Um, prosecutors in the Southern District brought forward a case against BNP Paribas for using the financial system at a time when it was prohibited. Okay, just uh, let me ask a couple of things here. Sure. One is this kind of crime is probably all over the world. This happens. Yes. But what's different here is that BNP Paribas is a big bank. Yes. And banks have legal and social obligations more than, you know, the rag man down the street. That's right. And banks have such a profile that if they violate this kind of law, it is absolutely worth investigating and prosecuting them. Yes. Yeah, so... so so walking this back, if you will, the really interesting thing, um, well, in this day and age, we think a lot about war crimes. We think, I mean, the wars are happening around the world. Innocent people, civilians are being injured everywhere. And we have tried in international justice to stem or curtail these acts from happening. But what we also have to recognize, and this is really why it's such a precedent-setting case, is... Today, we, we, we know that war is a business. It might not be a legitimate business, but it is a business. And so those of us that are involved in interna international criminal law need to view it through that lens and take a, perhaps a more holistic approach, if you will. And part of that holistic approach is looking not only at the actual tool or the soldier that commits the crime, 
and actually even going beyond the commander that commits that crime. And let's look at the financiers. Let's look at other people that contribute to these, um, these horrible acts. With a view to stopping the horrible exactly. acts. Exactly. So, this, is, this is really important. So ultimately, the, you know, the mission here is to cut off uh, dehumanizing, uh, violent, warlike acts everywhere they take place. Yeah. That's right. So in 2015, the U.S. government did criminally prosecute um, BNP Paribas here in the Southern District of, of New York, and they were fined um, close to Excuse me, the forfeited amount was over $8 billion. Billion dollars. Yes. We like to deal in large round numbers. Exactly. <laughs> so cl actually close to $9 billion, but a bit shy. Who's counting? Exactly. <laughs> so they were prosecuted here, and at sentencing, Department of Justice turned around and said, we want to hear from the affected communities, i.e. those communities that were affected from the transfer of money. Because their thoughts, their reactions, their comments are relevant to the sentencing. Well, I think that their thinking was that if, if they could hear from those that had been affected on the ground, that perhaps some of that forfeited money could be used to rebuild those communities, to do some sort of restorative justice for um, the Sudanese communities, Iranian communities, and the Cuban communities that had been hurt from this um, illicit flow of funds. Who decides that? Who puts that money back into those communities? Well, it was up to the Department of Justice, and to be very clear, in the U.S., it went back into a general fund. So it was up to the U.S., um, it was up to Maine Justice to decide whether the Attorney General, at that particular time, to decide where that money would go. Okay. And within the United States in 2015, what happened was that money was it's discretionary again, and it was used to replenish the funds for the 9-11 first responders. Ah, okay. So that's a, that's a terrific idea. We all, um, we want the first responders of the 9-11 um, attacks to receive compensation. But it really left those affected communities without a remedy. Yes. They, did, they didn't get a penny, they got nothing, and they were, they still deserve some sort of compensation. Yes. So with that in mind, um, PEJ participated. We submitted a brief to Department of Justice. We saw the money being diverted to the 9-11 first responders, and we looked for a remedy for our Sudanese client. And we elected to file a case in France after working on the case for four years. The allegations in France are quite different because there was no breach of um, using illicit funds, if you will. So at the beginning of this month, we filed a case um, in Paris alleging complicity in genocide and crimes against humanity. Okay, this is a different case. Different allegations. Different, different allegations. Crimes, different different statutes. statutes. Exactly. Different, a completely different but jurisdiction. But maybe relief that could be used to go back to Sudan and help those That's people. That's right. That's our hope. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So what is it trading with the enemy? What do you have to do to trade with the enemy? Well, you have to have a, one of a, a country that's on a, listed, a list of enemies. That's the first mm -hmm. thing. What do you have to do to trade with them? In, in I'll be sure I don't do that. <laughs> For sure. So, <laughs> we all want to make sure that we don't do that. So for institutions like banks, they, there are databases, if you will, that are in place that alert them to prohibited persons or prohibited entities. And in, in, if you were to read the statement of facts that, um, that was relied on during sentencing, it was quite clear that what BNP BNP Paribas did is they overrid their compliance officers and they knew very well that they were not they were not allowed to transfer funds to the government of Sudan so instead what they did is they used um, different entities created different entities they um, diverted the money so that it was less detectable if you will cover up exactly mm. so um, with that said yes so they covered it up uh, mainly through Geneva and the Paris um, headquarters. So after um, after seeing the Sudanese, the Cubans, and the Iranians without a remedy, we researched the issue and we decided that the French law was favorable to our clients. We sought out the help of French lawyers as we are um, not barred there. 
and we filed a case with the, with the help of our partners on behalf of nine Sudanese victims that had been injured through, um, through the genocide. Yeah, but you, uh, you were not alone, I guess. There were, you know, it was not, uh, you called it PEJ, just to be clear, that's Project Expedite Justice. Yes. Out of Kona. Yes. Okay, but um, you had International Federation for Human Rights, the League of the Rights of Man. Right. Did I get that right? The, that's in French. The African Center for Justice and Peace Studies, and the Sudan Human Rights Monitor. All of those organizations working together, yeah? That's right. So um, FIDH is a federation of organizations that promote and advance human rights. Mm -hmm. Their Sudanese partners also participated in this case, and that's the African um, ACJPS and the other organization that you referred to. So yes, we pushed the, the case forward together. But you have, to, you have to know the evidence. You have yes. to investigate the evidence. As I recall from our last discussion, that was something you did. You have done consistently. When yes. you worked in The Hague as a prosecutor, yes. and when you were an investigator, a sort of uh, a freelance investigator in uh, Kona, That's right. you were you're an investigator. So you had to investigate here and find out what Paribas was doing. How do you do that? Did you have the power of subpoena? No, or was we... it just charm? <laughs> I, I wish it was just charm. <laughs> but it's actually just a lot of hard work and a lot of digging, as we say, open source. Um, we find a lot of information on the internet. Um, it is actually shocking how, how technology has been able to help us all yeah. in, a, in creating and amassing information that yeah. is later used, identifying key players, identifying what happened, and combined with financial records, that's very helpful. But as you well know, financial crimes are one of the most difficult. While they, while they are the most effective tool that's available to us as prosecutors and as those that those of us that are pushing back on crime, yeah. they are very laborious and they take a lot of time to put together. Because but they're it, exciting from the investigator's point of view. Yes. There you have all these numbers on a page and for the average person, those numbers don't mean anything. And yet you look at them, you connect them up, you make analyses, you infer, you make inferences. That's right. And then it flashes on the wall, there it is. So, so it's very much a game of what you know. So if you know that somebody is, um, has an illicit flow, you can also look at a government, let's say, and find, assuming that it's a government that um, is receiving the money, and you can identify where their spend is. You know, it, where it are they- It becomes a little harder when they're trying to hide it, though. That's right, but it's not impossible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not impossible. So, <clears throat> wow, so did you have, did you have affirmative help in the investigation from those other organizations I listed, or was it only PEJ? Um, well, what PEJ is part of, um, part of the puzzle is, is, is that we do the factual analysis and we manage all of the, the witnesses and the, you know, the witnesses and the complainants, if you will. That was our contribution because we're, we are not French lawyers um, by any stretch of the imagination. But you can help French lawyers. Right. We partner with, a French, with a French lawyers to bring forward the case. Okay. So that's where FIDH came in, F-I-D-H. And they did a wonderful job. And also pro bono lawyers in France that help us um, to craft the complaint according to French law. <clears throat> okay, so here's, so we're talking about a complaint. This case has not yet been tried. That's right. And I, I, I should also state that it's very different knowing that most of our audience here is, is um, accustomed to a common law system, which is primarily adversarial, right? Mm -hmm. So here in the U.S., U.S. lawyers do the depositions. We do the interrogatories. We might question witnesses, and we put our best case forward as adversaries, and yes. the judge simply rules. Yes. I shouldn't say simply, but, but they take a more neutral position as an arbiter to ensure that the truth is known. Yes. However, in a civil law country, which is the French system, they have what they call a juge d'instruction, which is a more active role. And what that um, judges responsible for is very forward leaning. They are in charge of the investigation. They have a team of investigators that, and they are responsible for a more aggressive approach, if you will, to fact finding. And the lawyers take more of a, of a neutral role. We propose witnesses um, and we are allowed to yeah, provide guidance on a very limited. So by the time scale. it gets to a complaint, the juge d'instruction, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. 
the judge of instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, he's already made, he spent some time here. No, so what happens is that we file the complaint and it gets sent to the head juge of instruction who then assigns um, the appropriate juge. To... And that's where we are now. Exactly. Mm. So, interestingly, <clears throat> yes. BMPP, this is not the first complaint that they have faced, but there was, they, uh, there was a preceding case involving the Rwanda genocide where they were implicated in that case as well. They got a, a history. Is that relevant? I mean, is that admissible? Um, I don't think it's admissible on its face, but I think it does provide us with some glimpse of what um, pattern evidence intent evidence, knowledge evidence, and provides us with information on, on processes that are frequently used by that bank. So this is the celebration here, the notable news event, is that the complaint was filed. Yes. Because that means that, you know, there's a certain, we might call it probable cause here. Mm -hmm. uh, the evidence has been established as far mm -hmm. as the complainants are concerned, and it is going to trial, hopefully soon. I don't know what the timetable is like. Um, and at that, at that point, the evidence will be introduced, and hopefully there'll be a conviction. Yes, yeah. and it, it, the French system is just so different from ours. It, interestingly enough, one of the things that we learned was that a corporation can actually be put on trial, as opposed to individuals um, here, like we do in a common law system. So it's, it's different. So we lodge the complaint. It gets processed internally, and then hopefully we will hear from them within perhaps three to six months on, on what they decide to do. They could, for example, open parts of the case, finding um, bad acts with respect to torture, but not on all other offenses. Okay. They could accept in part and reject in part, as we say here in the U.S. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is pretty exciting to see. Yes. And you, you don't have input on that. No. They, you, you've, you've, you've given them the complaint. That's and right. And now it's up to them. That's right. But if there is a trial, you're going to go and introduce, or you're going to help the French lawyers introduce the evidence. Yes. So if there's a, for example, the next step that would happen is the juge instruction could interview um, witnesses and bring them forward. We would have to accompany those witnesses to Paris. We would not be allowed to participate in the process. We would not be allowed in the room, so to speak, but we would provide support for um, our clients. Wow, this is pretty exciting. Um, so you have the fourth biggest bank in the world here. They have a few bucks. They have some resources. Yes. They have friends. They probably have friends in government. Yes. That's the way it works. You must have had some pushback, or maybe you anticipate some pushback now. Yeah. Well, we, we'll have to see how those things, how those um, circumstances or factors play out for, for sure. That doesn't put you off the track for one minute, does it, Cynthia? No. <laughs> okay. No, not at all. I want to get that straight. No. Um, we, um, of course, they will have, you know, there's, there's no equality of arms here. We know that they will have more lawyers than ours, but we have eight teams of lawyers here on our side, and we will push the case forward um, as diligently as we can. Does the complaint ask for relief? Um, no, it doesn't ask, it doesn't ask for particular relief. And, and an, another difference between a common law system and a French system is that the awards are not as great. But similarly, in a French system, um, you, as a lawyer, because they're in the French system, there is a judicial instruction, the investment in discovery is a lot less. Whereas mm -hmm. here, if a law firm were to undertake the case, so to speak, you would have to consider your costs um, and your uh, of discovery of all of those things that you would need to do to bring the, the case forward. The onus really falls on the move on. Yeah, the right? civil law in many ways is more efficient, isn't it? Yes, I, I think it makes it more accessible for um, cases such as this that are very resource um, intensive. But we felt that that coupled with the fact that the jurisdictional book, if you will, um, that being that BNP Paribas is a French company, um, was an important, was the right choice for this particular case. Yeah, well, are you getting, what, what's the, the public opinion about this? Are you getting feedback from the public? Or people saying, good for you, you know, we, we were always wondering about Paribas, and now, you know, you've demonstrated there's some fire behind the smoke. Well, I, I think that, um, I, I can't say that we've received specific feedback, but what I will say is that within the international criminal community, within the practitioners groups, that there is, there has always been a thought that we need to look at this more holistically, that no longer should we rely, we have not been successful 
in you know making war stop. We haven't, we have not stepped on that um, in its entirety. Mm. And so, as a group, we understand that that really pursuing the financiers is the next wave or the next set, if you will. Mm. And it's very important to recognize that. Could you have gone to the Hague to the International Court of Criminal? Justice in the Hague, your old, your old uh, uh, stomping grounds? We could have, um, yes. It, there, it's not explicitly um, accounted for, just as it's not explicitly accounted for, let's say, environmental crimes. But yes, in theory, you could apply there. Mm -hmm. We just felt that the national system to address this particular crime in France was the best and most efficient approach. Has, has the French, have the French courts taken cases like this in the yes. past? They so have. there's a certain amount of precedent here. That's right. So the Rwanda case that I re referred mm. to earlier, that was filed in France. I believe that there was also a cement company, I believe Lafage, in, in uh, Libya, um, was also um, prosecuted there. So it, it's, not, um, it's not a standalone. But again, we believe that it's, it's very important as a precedent to, to deter um, other financiers from moving in this direction. We want people to know that if you choose to finance with the knowledge that, the, that your money is being used to commit um, crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes, that there are consequences. And you are treated the same as, as the actor, if you will. So no, no individuals have been charged here. This is a, a, a I guess it's a, it's a criminal case. Yes. Um, but the defendant, if you will, is the, is the corporation, BNP yes. Paribas. Yes. Um, and it can also be um, with, of course, the naming of those that are principally responsible. But they, they don't risk going to jail. They and do. They do. Oh, so the court can identify the ones that you identified. Yes. And said, you're a defendant yes. now. Just like in any business, there's an executive officer, there's a CFO, ah. there are, there's an executive committee and boards that make the most critical decisions for any company. Let's take torture for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know there's a guy at Columbia Law School that teaches torture? That's his subject? And, and the students come from miles around so they can learn about what he has to teach. Anyway, so torture. So uh, Paribas uh, gives some money in violation of the trading with the enemy mm -hmm. concept to the wrong people who are, in fact, doing torture. Right. Is that enough? If you can show that Paribas gave them the money and they knew that this government entity, this, this dictator, what have you, was torturing people, um, and in fact, he did torture them. Um, do you have to connect it up further? Do you have to show that the money specifically enabled this guy to do torture? Yes, I think you have to, you have to uh, put the screws on the engine, if you will. You have to tighten it up a little bit, yes. It's not enough. Um, many, many times people will say, well, that's an airplane that bombed me. That airplane is part of this government. Therefore, that's enough. It's not. You have to show orders. You have to show uh, a greater causation or F nexus, if you will. Follow the money. Exactly. And you can. You have yes. to, but for that, you have to get into the dictator's records. Yes. You, you, would, you would have to know for a country, how, how does the money, how is the money appropriated? Who makes those decisions? Where did the money go? And with so what you're knowledge? you're evaluating it on both sides. Exactly. One is that the bank is giving it to this organization, this country. And then and what the, happens to the money? What happens at the country? Exactly. In both places. Exactly. And, it, and you say you can do it on the internet, but you probably have to go there too, right? Um, not always. Not hmm. always. But, yeah. I, I'm not carrying your bag when you go to these places. <laughs> That's where you with... draw the line. <laughs> 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 yeah. It sounds pretty risky but, to me. But, but like any, but, but like any um, company, you know, you're going to try to find an insider. There will be people that are perhaps um, whistleblowers people that are, who know how the internal governmental workings are that, that later become disgruntled, that may wish to share that information. Well, taking it a, a step further, let's, let's assume this goes through the juge d'instruction, mm -hmm. uh, that there's ultimately a conviction uh, that the bank and some of its officers are found responsible criminally, uh, and that a, hopefully a large fine is imposed, maybe even jail terms on the individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what do you hope to achieve with that? I mean, of course, you're making a statement. 
Uh, and as we discussed before, you can try to diminish the amount of bad activity like this around the world. But how would that work? If I, if I nail uh, BNP Paribas, mm -hmm. are, is every bank going to know about it? Is every bank going to adjust their conduct? Uh, are, we gonna have, are we, in fact, going to have less torture in the world? We hope. Yes, that's what we hope. We want to deliver the message that if you participate in these, if you, if you choose to fund or spend your money in this fashion, and you know how it's going to be used, you should be held accountable just as a direct perpetrator is, is held accountable. That is the message. So the the individual um, plaintiffs, of course, can use their award as they see fit. So you want to get in this, in this case, as opposed to the Southern District case that you spoke of, mm -hmm. in this case, you want to get the court to distribute the money to the people who were victimized. That's right. And so, that would be a decision made by this French court. That's right. That's, That's part right. of the complaint. That's right. So oh. our hope is that um, when we filed the complaint, we filed with um, a handful, literally a handful of plaintiffs, with the hope that um, if the case is opened, then we could add more plaintiffs, if you will. Yeah. How high does this stand on, on the mountain of such activity in the world? In other words, uh, are, you, are you the only show in town? where there are many PEJs around that are doing the same thing, and many of these French organizations, too, that are doing them. There must be other cases, right? There must be other people who feel and act the way you do. Am I right? Indeed. I think that there are a number of practitioners in this, in this sector, if you will, that really are looking very, very hard at financial crimes and looking more holistically at how to end atrocities. And this is just one tool that we use. Now, what about... What about uh, let's take Russia just as a, an example, uh, with an oligarch, okay, who mm -hmm. is funding money. Well, the country itself is funding money, mm -hmm. um, and you find out about it. You find out the money is going to a dictator uh, or somebody who is engaged in really bad, uh, you know, activities. Um, is, is this something that would also be covered by the same approach, or is it different when you're talking about a country or an oligarch? Um. Well, I think that the first analysis has to be whether or not that they're a prohibited person. And what, what I mean by that is whether or not they're subjected to the OFAC um, sanction program. Yeah. And if they are, if, if they aren't, why not? Yeah. And should they be? Yeah. You know, uh, because they're corrupt or, and or because they committed human rights violations. So that would be an analysis that would be performed and perhaps one of the doors, if you will, the doors of justice or tools that we would use. Absolutely. And you would go against a country? You could go against individuals in a country. So for example, if I find out that a country is doing the same thing as BNP uh, Paribas is doing, and I found a court that would take my complaint, say in France, um, I could go after the country the same way? You could. You mm. could. This opens the door to all kinds of things. Yeah. It becomes historic in its own way. Well, I think, yes, I, I think the really interesting, um, the, the time, if you will, or, you know, the time in which we're living is a very interesting time <laughs> where, we're, we, where we are seeing that traditional norms, traditional places where you would look for justice, such as a court, are, are perhaps one avenue of accountability and, and, and a valid, you know, door to, towards accountability. But there are also other steps that we can take, um, such as placing, you know, going to the U.S. Treasury and asking that an individual be sanctioned. That there are other steps that we can take to highlight the issue and also make it more difficult in, um, in, a, in a shorter period of time, if you will, to, to cut off money flows so that crimes are, are reduced. That's the idea. Last question, Cynthia. Sure. Um, you're, you're seeing this. You're, you're traveling. You're talking to the people who are involved. You're sort of seeing the detail. You're drilling down on these things, not only in, in the law, but you're drilling down on in all the players in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so, and... and and I, as I said before, it sounds like there's plenty of bad action going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's being funded by bad actors who know, who know better. But your effort and the effort of these other organizations that are involved in the, the Paribas case, 
Is it growing? Will there be more of it? We, will we see more suits like this? Yes, I believe so. Um, of course, one can't be certain. But are these, is there a finite amount of bad actors? No, there's not. We all know that, that, there, that there's not. We're yeah. just trying to send the message to this bank in particular and other financiers that this conduct is not appropriate. And just because you are not the direct perpetrator, that you are not absolved. You are too responsible. Good for you, Cynthia. I said it last time, and I'll say it again. It's really wonderful to meet somebody, spend a little time with somebody who is actually engaged, taking risk, making the world a better place. Uh, it's so important in our time. Thank you so much on behalf of everyone, all eight billion of us. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Next time we'll do it again. Yes. <laughs>